Hello and welcome. I would like to welcome you to the second part of our confer uh, conference uh, on uh, the way to a new constitution in the uh, Mediterranean and North African uh, countries. And uh, we shall be examining one of uh, uh, this uh, process uh, at hand of different countries. At the end of 2010, this started in Tunisia and then uh, was uh, and spread to other countries. And all these uprising people, uh, they had one shout, namely the people would like to overthrow uh, the order. That was a radical slogan. And uh, it was uh, a slogan that uh, contained universal demands like freedom, uh, dignity, social uh, justice, bread, and employment. And uh, this uh, universal uh, dimension of these demands Uh, were not any different than they were in similar movements in the United States and in the Western European countries at their time. So this was an uprising, and in none of these countries the st struggle is over yet. Okay, did the order change? Uh, w to what extent uh, d was the demand realized? Who uh, and which forces are trying to prevent this from happening? Uh, what is the progress of uh, uh, these uh, uprising people right now? Uh, we have uh, guests from Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, and Turkey. Uh, we decided uh, to uh, start with Algeria uh, because uh, after uh, after uh, Bin Ali left, uh, we were expecting something more uh, to occur. Immediately after the movement started, the Algerian president, who was in uh, power uh, and uh, was conducting an um, extraordinary uh, rule for uh, 20 years, started to make certain um, proposals. Omar uh, Bendera uh, was uh, living in Paris. He is from the International Committee of Solidarity with the Algerian Free Trade Union. So he will do the first uh, speech. Thank you for the organizers to, gave, to give us the opportunity to uh, present the situation of uh, <coughs> countries. The question is frequently asked since the beginning of what the media calls the Arab Spring. Why this movement seemed to bypass Algeria? All the conditions are present for a mass expression of popular discontent. All indicators from Algeria converge towards a deep and continuous degradation of the social situation, soaring unemployment and the increasing economic distress of much of the population. Socioeconomic conditions of large number of Algerians are even more unacceptable now that Algeria has enjoyed sev several years of booming oil prices af after the near collapse of the 80s and the 90s. An impressive financial opulence evidenced by record levels of foreign exchange reserves close to $200 billion. In a climate of corruption and racketeering, the strategy implemented by the government since the early 2000s, essentially government spending to promote growth in non-hydrocarbon sectors are proved completely ineffective. Real growth between 2% and 3.5% per year between 2006 and 2010 is well below the minimum required to develop a productive economy and reduce unemployment. Astronomical cost overruns on gigantic but unfinished projects and the steady growth of imports, including food, evidence of failed economic policy that is dangerously crippling public accounts. In balances due by such massive yet unproductive expenditures, are unsustainable. Thus, the government's radical illegitimacy 
is compounded by its inability to execute a development program despite the colossal financial resources expended. Faced with complete mismanagement and stratospheric corruption, the government was forced to substantially reduce its $150 billion program uh, for the period 2009-2013. In a country where virtually no public service is working properly, Algerians are unemployed, poorly housed, poorly cared for, and live with no hope of rapid improvement in their conditions. The economic and social statistics are notoriously unreliable. The official unemployment figures, which miraculously declined from 29% in 2000 to 15.3% in 2005 and to 10.2% uh, in late 2009, complacently relayed by the World Bank, would be mildly amusing if they did not mask a brutal reality. Despite this statistical black hole, experts estimate that the level of extreme poverty is high. Over 15% of the population, which is around 32 million people, 15% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. And income disparities are very large. Whole categories of people are simply abandoned. And the plight of cancer patients Unable to find drugs for their treatment is emblematic of the criminal capture of large parts of the healthcare system. Despite colossal financial resources, the educational system from primary school to university is devastated. Algeria is ranked 104th on 182 countries in the Human Development Index of the UN, a reflection of the poor governance. In fact, People are left to the negligence of a government far removed from people's concern and whose principal characteristics are its capacity to harm its citizens and its corruption. Not only is the business climate suffocating, in the words of the World Bank, but there is an atmosphere of constant tension fueled by living conditions which are too often humiliating. The absence of the state encourages widespread outbreaks of violence and social ills. Outside the protected areas inhabited by the privileged, the ubiqu ubiquitous police fail to prevent widespread insecurity and proliferation widespread banditry. Faced with this situation, the only recourse available to le pouvoir, as we name the power in Algeria, to try to stem the discontent is to distribute periodically in a regal and erratic fashion part of the economic rent to those who reclaim it most loudly. The ruling bureaucracy, a military financial comprador bourgeoisie, formed around the heads of military intelligence, is based, based on two instruments, police surveillance and corruption. The security apparatus forms, forms the invisible backbone of the system, which, ignoring completely the law, empties institution of any substance and very considerably weakens the state. Police supervision is, carry, is carried out using a very tight territorial security net and police control of all institutions and organizations, whether administrative, media, economic, cultural, religious, whether or not they are nom nominally part of civil society. The institutional Algeria is a Potemkin village. The reality of the dictatorship hides behind the legal facade. The real power is outside the institutions. <coughs> Sorry. The very tight police surveillance is accompanied by a strategy of fragmentation of social struggles and anesthesia by corruption. A rentier economy based on exploitation of fossil resources can indeed award grants and stipends to its clients and minimally respond to social demands by increasing the salaries in the public sector and distributing credit to unemployed youth, officially for business creation or to youth employment, but which are primarily used for the purchase of cars and other consumer goods. 
the orientation of a part of the rent to clients and dangerous social categories allows the creation of wealth and level of conspicuous consumption unrelated to economic activity. But it cannot calm massive expectation of the populace. The despair of Algeria results in the phenomenon of illegal immigration, we call it haraga, and the multiplication of localized riots has become a daily uh, eruption of spontaneous popular anger, but which is without leadership or political structures. The period of the 1990 civil war, which caused 200,000 deaths, according to the official uh, figures, nearly 20,000 disappeared, and forced displacement of hundreds of thousands of people allowed the regime to break all representative political structures. The military junta that decided to stop the electoral process in January 1992 naturally carries the primary responsibility of a terrible bloodbath and a succession of unheard atrocities. But some Islamist leaders certainly share the guilt in having advocated armored struggle against the coup leaders and their allies. The, dirt, the dirty war and the climate of terror that was created allowed the dismantling of the public sector and the application of a structural adjustment program in 1994 under the aegis of the IMF, which resulted in the orientation of the economy. <clears throat> the anti-subversive uh, anti war and the procession of emergency laws that have accompanied it mainly allowed the lockdown of the political process and the creation of a trompe l'oeil, a fake political scene, seen under police supervision. This shadow play between an opposition constitute of cartoon characters, as Egyptian said, <laughs> and the party of government <coughs> has no links with political realities and is simply a screen for the interest groups that effectively run the country. The war against terror, with its legal provisions and administration, was a way to silence any critical expression, to block any form of peaceful organization of society, and to prohibit the right of demonstration and assembly. The lifting of the state of emergency in February 2011 this, uh, this state of emergency was introduced in February 1992, uh, is a purely formal concession following the Arab revolts and did not alter the repressive management in place since the coup of January 1992. The new laws of, on information and on association confirm the restriction on freedom of expression and repress more than in the past the freedom of association. Parties and associations outside the control of military intelligence before the coup of January 1992 were brought under control and their leadership co-opted. With the exception of the uh, Socialist Forces Front, uh, chaired by Hussein Ait Ahmed, the political parties that are most frequently cited by a compliant press are mere extensions of the system, including those calling for a boycott of the uh, near legislative elections. Organization of uh, so-called civil society, with the notable exception of some autonomous unions and some human rights uh, NGOs, uh, the Algerian uh, Association for Human Rights and the SOS Missing, are empty shells used to maintain the illusion to the outside world that there, there is a real political space in Algeria. Algerians, not fooled in the least by the manipulation of the system, are in their vast majority oblivious to the official propaganda and have no confidence whatsoever in either the actors or institution of the political system. Saturated by violence, Algerian society is truly anomic. It is in this extremely fragile internal situation that the regime now faces changes in its immediate geostrategic environment. Social movements that have swept the Tunisian regime, presented of a model of enlightened authoritarian rule, and the fall of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, have been perceived as a, as a direct threat by the senior deciders of Algeria. But what has obviously baffled and stunned the generals in the intelligence service 
is the Western intervention in Libya. The new imperialist order gives the flavor of the days to the gunboat policy, while at the same time realigning its relation with the conservative and obscurantist wing of political Islam, the, the, the, the, broad, the Islamic Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood under the Saudi Qatari umbrella is no longer demonized by the West, who now see them as effective partners in the preservation of its interests in the Arab, world, Arab Muslim world. Faced with the disastrous failure of Republican dictatorships, the old colonialism, dropping themselves new in new clothes of the right to protect, can present itself as the liberated of the Arab people. The NATO intervention in Libya and games of influence around the Syrian crisis, the updating of relation with Islam under Wahhabi influence in Tunisia and Egypt are all indicators for concern for le pouvoir, for the, uh, the system. Although it always given all the guarantees the West requested, the Algerian regime is aware that the full support enjoyed so far from France and the United States could be jeopardized if the strategic calculation of these powers were to change. The Syrian situation, a broader regime par excellence, shows that one can be courted one day and shunned the next. Long-standing alliances, including with a client regime that is cut off from this, its people, can be rapidly altered due to the extent of the fractures in the geostrategic region. The hypothesis, still distant, is nevertheless reinforced by the disintegration of the Malian government and the proclamation of independence of the Azawad by the Tuareg rebellion in March uh, 2012. The evolution of the Sahelian crisis weakens the position of Algiers, charge Mezzovoce, by many quasi-official observers to play an assertive, if ambiguous, role in the Sahel. The abduction of hostages in the Sahara by terrorist organization known to be manipulated by the Algerian secret police, are all elements that fuel the suspicions about the real intentions of Algeria's rulers vis-a-vis -vis a very complex problem in the Sahel. In this vast hinterland, transnational criminal organizations involved in drug trafficking and smuggling operate alongside jihadists of all stripes and widely infiltrated by various secret services, regional and western and normal banditry on a background of abject poverty and marginalization of the Tuareg population. Their region, immense and very difficult to control, however, is coveted for its still untapped mineral and hydrocarbon potential. The creation of the Military Command for Africa, AFRICOM, in, 20, in, 200, <coughs> in 2006, in the wake of the U.S. Pan-Sahel Initiative, PSI, launched in 2004, is a clear indicator of the interest of the United States in a region where the France-Afrique, the, the network linking France to Africa, net, uh, the France-Afrique networks with their economic interests determine the direction of very vulnerable post-colonial states. The crisis in Mali, more than the Libyan conventions, could have a direct impact on southern Algeria where the temptation of autonomy, still embryonic, is fueled by the frustration of local people. The frustration of Saharan population, including the condition of abandonment, is even greater than the, in the north of the country, is fueled by the fact that they do not benefit from the hydrocarbon resources that extra are extracted from the Sahara, their own region. The structural instability of Algeria, the country inept, country's inept governance and excessive corruption of its leaders are the levers that Westerners, especially Americans, use to pressure the Algerian regime and bring in to modernize its management of the country. The activism of the American ambassador is a case in point. By his traveling around the country, lauding the parliamentary system and calling for participation in the legislative elections. The United States adapt perfectly to the fully aligned Algerian system in spite of the nationalist rhetoric as it lacks substance. Whether in the field of global war against terrorism or in oil, Algiers responds essentially to imperial expectations. 
Washington understands, however, a, that a collapse of the Algerian state and uncontrollable social explosion could have unpredictable regional repercussions. So there is a pressure to give some popular legitimacy to the electoral system that could have a more acceptable appearance for the West and prepares as much as possible an orderly transition, or, a, or rather a facelift, towards a system that is still more presentable and better accepted by the population. It's under the triple constraints of endemic social discontent, winds of protest from the East, and Western pressure that the regime holds parliamentary elections. This time, it assures it will be free of the usual fraud. And it is quite possible that this indeed technically be the case. Politics and media are almost completely locked, annoying personalities prohibited from speaking. Almost all of the authorized parties, primarily the Islamists, under police control. So it is no longer necessary to manipulate the poll, except to exaggerate the participation of the electorate. The main obstacle lies indeed in the very low mobilization of the citizen who know the results were always decided in advance and that the election's results are those that the regime decides. The current parliamentary representation was elected in May 2007 with less than 15% participation. The official figure was 35.17. And it is not at all sure that this rate will be exceeded during the next election scheduled for 10 May uh, to, uh, 2012. The level of turnout is, only, is the only concern of the regime. Can these elections, anyway, can change the nature of the regime whose decision center is extremely concentrated and be the start of a transition to a democratic and representative system? That's the question. The answer is unequivocal. Nothing will change apart from the forms. It is very likely, indeed, that the so-called nationalist parties FLN and RND are superseded by those who claim to political Islam. The winner and loser will bot only apparatus, apparatuses managed by elements selected by the political police. The Islamization of the society in its reactionary form, combining profiteering and obscurantist moralizing, does not, does not interfere with those who hold power. This shows, once again, that the Algerian crisis cannot be summed up as an ideological confrontation between secular modernists and Islamic fanatics. Can the constitution of a democratic facade according to formal standards of the West that satisfies the United States and French sponsor of the Algerian regime be enough to prevent an explosion that all feel is inevitable? In this hypothesis, does the army whose elite and mechanized troops are first and foremost designed to maintain domestic order, keep its cohesion under the direction of the political police who supervise, supervise it and manage its promotions? No one knows. The Algerian people will celebrate the 5th of July, the 50th anniversary of a hard-won independence. The official Algeria will commemorate in the utmost discretion this highly symbolic anniversary. It is true that the result of half of a century of almost uninterrupted dictatorship are terrible. The social and democratic republic envisioned by the revolutionaries of the 1st November of 1954 has not emerged. On the contrary, the colonial order was followed by a draconian system that was both arbitrary and sterile. The history is disturbing because it holds a very cruel mirror to those who, by diverting the Algerian revolution from its democratic course, led the country into a bloody stalemate. The divorce between the Algerian people and the system of oppression that crushes the country has long been consummated. Maintaining the di this direction, bearing in mind the limited Algerian resources of hydrocarbons and absolute dependence to imports, poses a serious threat to the future of the Algerian people. Algeria, exhausted by blood and violence, is a country where historic, historic cycles are long, but the era of dictatorships inevitably draws to a close. The Algerian spring, long overdue, will eventually come. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's
Birden İngilizceye geçtim ama Türkçe devam edeyim. Birazcık e, karamsar. No, that was a bit pessimistic e, presentation, and I hope that the Tunisian re revolution is still going on. And I would like to give the floor floor to Shukri Way. He is a young uh, academician. Uh, he uh, has. Uh, uh, also important uh, research uh, projects. Conference uh, organizers, uh, organizers uh, also uh, for this, uh, for my invitation to, to this uh, uh, conference. Uh, yes, the case uh, of Tunisia is uh, interesting uh, for uh, two main reasons. Uh, and the revolution is uh, uh, ongo it's an ongoing process till now. Uh, despite Tunisia is uh, uh, an unknown uh, country, and uh, it's not so noisy. We don't uh, people don't uh, know a lot about this small country, uh, which population is uh, about 10 uh, million, so uh, uh, less than uh, the st the city of uh, Istanbul. But uh, it's uh, also a great country because uh, uh, it's the, the the the country that initiated the Arab revolts and the so-called Arab Spring. And uh, therefore, it's a subject of uh, special attention from the uh, international uh, community and other uh, Arab countries, uh, and uh, Islamic countries in particular. Uh, secondly, and uh, this point is related to, to, to the first, uh, it's interesting because uh, of uh, the strong uh, performativity of, uh, the, of two uh, revolutionary moments um, that is to say that uh, in the case of Tunisia, uh, the uh, uprising has a real effect on uh, reality and uh, the words uh, used during this uprising uh, had an effect on uh, and a direct and profound effect on uh, reality. Uh, I, I must uh, remind that uh, the end of the, f uh, uh, what I call in my, my research, because I'm uh, carrying out uh, uh, fieldwork research uh, since uh, uh, February, uh, uh, last February uh, uh, um, 2011 uh, in Tunisia about uh, the uh, social movements and the, the revolutionary process. Uh, I must remind that the end of uh, what I call the first revolutionary uh, situation, which uh, begin, uh, began in uh, December 7th, the 17th in Sidi Bouzid uh, and ended in, uh, uh, on uh, the 14th of January uh, 2011, uh, uh, had uh, this... Uh, uh, had the slogan with, which was uh, Ben Ali lived, uh, Ben Ali dégage in, in, in French and in, also in Tunisian, uh, and ended with uh, uh, the flight of Ben Ali uh, in, uh, the, in January 14th. Uh, and the second revolutionary uh, situation, uh, which began after uh, this flight, uh, was characterized by, uh, by uh, other uprisings and other uh, demonstrations uh, which, that uh, demand uh, the uh, fall of the regime and the go government, uh, the uh, uh, state party, the former state party to, to release, and uh, also a constituent assembly. And uh, the end of this, uh, of this situation, in uh, uh, the end of, the, of February, uh, 2011 uh, ended with uh, the decision of the second second provisional government uh, composed uh, of former ministers of the old regime uh, decision to uh, hold elections for a constituent assembly uh, scheduled during the summer of uh, 2011. Uh, however, this performativity and the election of uh, constituent assembly on last October uh, have not removed nor weakened uh, nor social movements nor the old regime uh, as well. On the contrary, uh, social, movement, uh, social movements continue for over a year to be the daily lot in various fields and all over the country. 
Uh, in recent weeks, uh, we see the, that the radicality of their modes of action and their claims and grievances, uh, the people want uh, to work, uh, justice for the wounded and the injured of the revolution, uh, has thwarted the work of the government led by uh, Hamad Ijbeli, uh, which is the, the prime minister of Tunisia uh, from uh, Nahda party, the Islamist party, uh, who uh, won the uh, elections uh, in uh, the 23 of October uh, 2011. Uh, the government's reaction was not long in coming. Uh, the, demonstra the, the demonstrations in April uh, the 7th in Tunis to demand jobs for unemployed uh, graduates and those, especially those of April 9th to celebrate the Day of Martyrs uh, were harshly repre repressed which has generated uh, their condemnation of, uh, by many political and human rights organi organizations. Therefore, uh, one of the most important aspects of the Tunisian revolution is the dialectic between social demands, social grievances, and political demands. Uh, revolutions are not only political, uh, they are also, and perhaps above all, social, and this is the uh, case of Tunisia, they are social and political, uh, and it's a constant dialectic since December the 17th, uh, 2010. Uh, if we take this date as the start of the first uh, revolutionary situation in Tunisia, when uh, Mohammed Bouazizi uh, has self-immolated uh, in front of the uh, wilaya of Sidi Bouzid. I think one can read, uh, can read the, the history of Tunisia from December the 17th uh, as the succession of four revolutionary situations. Uh, the first, uh, I uh, uh, remind it, uh, it, began on the 17th of uh, December and ended, finished on the 14th uh, of January uh, 2011 with uh, the flight of uh, Ben Ali and uh, uh, the article uh, um, 1556 uh, uh, of the Constitution uh, uh, when the Prime Minister took over uh, as the President of the Republic uh, temporarily prevented. And the second rev rev uh, revolutionary situation uh, began on the 14th, uh, 14th of, Jan of January and ended on the 27th of February uh, when uh, the uh, provisional government, composed of former uh, ministers of uh, the old regimes, uh, uh, resignated uh, after a big uh, mobilization and, uh, and protest in the uh, place of the government of El Kasba uh, in Tunis and uh, led to uh, uh, another uh, provisional uh, government of uh, Beji Qaid Sipsi, which is a, a former minister of uh, Habib Bourguiba. Uh, he's about uh, 84. Uh, and uh, uh, the claims for a constituent assembly led to this, uh, uh, to the, real, the, realiza the realization of this claim uh, by a high uh, authority. Uh, the third revolutionary situation, uh, which began in uh, the 27th uh, of February and ended on 23, uh, 23rd of, of October, uh, was characterized by the uh, fix uh, of the uh, electoral process, uh, the creation of uh, high authority for uh, independent elections, uh, uh, the political campaign, uh, an electoral campaign, and uh, uh, ended with the election for uh, uh, the uh, Constituent Assembly. And the fourth uh, revolutionary uh, situation uh, since uh, the 23rd of October till now uh, is characterized by the composition of this co Constituent Assembly, uh, the election of the President of the Assembly, uh, of the government and of the Republic, uh, uh, and an appointment, uh, the appointment of a new government on the, 20, uh, on the uh, 23, 23rd of December. And uh, this uh, situation is 
uh, not uh, quite because uh, we still uh, uh, witness a lot of multi-sector mobilization uh, and uh, uh, different conflicts between Nahda uh, and uh, the trade union, uh, for example, or Nahda and uh, the opposition, uh, the so-called democratic opposition, uh, and also Salafist events. So I will uh, develop uh, three main ideas in my intervention now. Um, first, I will uh, analyze the choice of the Constituent Assembly as a, a non-uncertain process. After that, I will uh, uh, see the, the, the, uh, analyze the dialectic between uh, political demands and social demands, and I will end with uh, an analysis of the confrontation between the Islamist and modernists uh, opposition. So we must first emphasize that the process that led Tunisia to the adoption of the solution of the Constituent, uh, constituent Assembly is not a dynamic that emerged uh, only among jurists, lawyers, or politicians. Uh, this solution was uh, the issue uh, and, the and the outcome of uh, a violent struggle between uh, uh, different political groups involved in, within the revolution uh, process. Indeed, the option of the Constituent Constituent Assembly uh, was one of the strongest political demands uh, of the movement called uh, the Casbah uh, that uh, uh, began in uh, last uh, in uh, uh, the end of January uh, 2011 and ended in the end of February. And this movement began in, uh, uh, of the inner regions of Tunisia, uh, primarily uh, Sidi Bouzid. Uh, and Kasserine, uh, after the first one held in late January that ended with its suppression by the police. Activists were protesting essentially against the presence of former ministers, as I said, uh, of Ben Ali in the interim government of Mohamed Ghanoushi, which is not Rashid Ghanoushi, uh, uh, okay, uh, Ben Ali's prime minister since uh, 1999. Uh, and thereby against the permanency of the institution of the old regime. So uh, the most uh, uh, known uh, slogan was "Shab yurid esqat al-nizam." People want the removal of the regime of, of the order uh, of the system. Uh, they staged uh, a sit-in extended on uh, government square at the Casbah during two weeks, and political parties such as Al-Nahda and the Union Trade uh, UGTT. Uh, has directly or indirectly participated to the movement. Uh, its outcome, outcome was very uncertain. Uh, the occupation of the place was violently repressed by security forces as the Hajj uh, rally, about, uh, uh, uh, about 100,000 persons, uh, held on uh, February the 25th. Uh, whose uh, main slogan was, uh, the people want a, a constituent assembly. Uh, the, ev the event ended in confusion, clashed with police and blood, uh, and the consequence of this extended sitting was twofold. First, the resignation of uh, Mohamed Ghanoushi's government and the nomination of uh, Beji Qaida Sebsi, uh, as I said, a former minister of uh, Habib Bourguiba, a historical leader of the Constitutional uh, Democratic Rally, which was the state party in Tunisia for the uh, last uh, 50 years. Um, second, uh, the political class, aided by cross-cutting mo mobilizations, such as lawyers, uh, trade unionists, party activists, young and um, unemployed uh, graduates, has uh, largely succeeded in imposing the creed, the credo that uh, the best way to continue the revolution uh, by other means was the elections for uh, the Constituent Assembly. There was an overall consensus uh, on this point between the left and the progressive uh, forces, also among the Arab nationalists, uh, the old elites of uh, the Constitutional Democratic uh, Rally, uh, the Islamists of uh, Al Nahda, but not the Salafi uh, Al Tahrir uh, party, which is banned in Tunisia till now. Uh, but above all, the main actor uh, was the UGTT. So uh, there is a, a gap uh, that is uh, noteworthy in the case of Tunisia. Uh, although it's hard to 
put a break with the past into action as seen for, for the reform of the judicial or security apparatus or the media. Uh, the political revolution has been successful in many ways. Uh, the most radical rupture was the holding of these uh, free, democratic and transparent elections on uh, October via the creation of the High Independent Authority for the elections designated in the end of May uh, 2011. But also the formation of the Constituent National Assembly and that of the government, uh, government uh, two months after the election uh, and also the election of the President of the Republic. So not only the temporary authorities but also political actors uh, and most of the militant and uh, activist and political organizations, trade union, has converted to uh, the idea of the constituent assembly, despite the differences uh, over the nature of the regime, uh, parliamentary, presidential, etc., and on the election date. Uh, let us uh, see now, analyze now the, the, the, the relationship of the dialectic between uh, political demands and social demands. It's my uh, second point. Uh, the choice of the constituent, uh, constituent assembly uh, had two contradic uh, contradictory effects. On one hand, uh, it has accelerated the process of institutional reform, not revolution, reform, and electoral competition between old and new politicians. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it emphasized the urgency of uh, social transformation and the impatience of the most disadvantaged groups, such as unemployed, uh, excluded, and precarious. Uh, the, main the main advances and achievements uh, took place within the institutional field and specifically uh, within uh, political institutions. Thus, from the announcement uh, of elections for the Constituent Assembly, Tunisians have witnessed from early March and during three months the creation of new political institutions and the deleting of old ones that somehow have fallen into disuse or became uh, illegitimate. The characteristic of uh, the new institutions is that they evolve between legality and uh, legitimacy. They are not resulting uh, from elections but uh, their creation is often the result of uh, executive orders issued by the President of the Republic, the provisional President uh, of the Republic, for Edom Baza, who is also an old uh, classic of uh, the uh, democratic uh, rally. Uh, <laughs> okay, seven minutes. Seven minutes, so seven minutes. Um, Perhaps I developed the third, the third point about the confrontation between uh, Islamist and modernist uh, opposition. Um, the results of the, the, the elections for the Constituent Assembly uh, revealed uh, three surprises. It was expected uh, that the Islamist party, Nahda, uh, would win even if uh, this victory is uh, relative. Uh, they did not get, on the evening of October the 23rd, uh, an absolute majority in the assembly. Thus, uh, so-called Troika uh, was formed in the weeks that followed the elections. Uh, it, it took the form of an alliance between three major parties, uh, an Nahda, uh, led by uh, Rashid Ghanoushi, and two parties that can be classified on the center-left, uh, the, the Congress for the Republic, uh, led by Monsef Marzouki, the, the current uh, president of the Republic, and uh, the Democratic Front for Labor and Liberties, uh, headed by uh, Mustafa bin Jafar, the current president of the National Assembly. So taken together, these parties won nearly 64% uh, of the Assembly seats, uh, and uh, the first surprise uh, was that the main losers uh, were the self-nominated secularists or Democrats parties uh, composed of the, uh, ex the extreme left, uh, the Tunisian Workers' Communist Party, uh, won only three seats, uh, although he's, uh, he was a very important, uh, important organ organization, an activist organization uh, who uh, played a, a, a real and uh, a central role uh, in the revolution. 
but especially the modernist democratic poll made for much of the, uh, the renovated Communist Party and the Democratic Progressive Party did not exceed 10% uh, uh, of the seats. The second surprise is the collapse of uh, parties from uh, the uh, former uh, state party of the old regime, which leveled off at less than 2.5%. And finally, the third surprise was the list of the popular petition for justice, freedom, and development, which is a demagogic and populist party, especially in disadvantaged internal regions, and he, uh, they, want, uh, they won uh, 29 seats, making it the second political force uh, of the country. These results were interpreted in Tunisia and in Europe as the victory of the Islamic uh, winter, succeeding to the democratic spring. Uh, both journalists and experts have tried to show that the democratic aspirations of the Tunisian men and women would be thwarted by the power of the Islamic party, described as non-democratic or authoritarian. It is worth noting that the, since the electoral campaign, the party leaders uh, who have lost the elections, especially those who claim to modernity, the defense of uh, individual liberties, even the legacy of uh, Habib Bourguiba, are likely to show that the intentions of the largest party in power is uh, the Islamization of Tunisian society and the preparation of a theocracy. Uh, actually, the discussions and the political debates that occupy the public space before, uh, during, and after the campaign focused on the identity of Tuni a Tunisian state and a society. A series of dramatic events popularized by the media came regularly to remind uh, Tunisians that the key issue that needed to be discussed was the place of Islam within society, politics, and the, cons the, cons uh, the constitution. Uh, but contrary to popular belief, uh, the, the attention paid to these debates is not new. Uh, it developed under the regime of Bourguiba and Ben Ali, uh, whereas this matrix has mainly organized the opposition to the dictatorship. It is therefore not surprising that it continues to structure the political opposition after the flight of the dictator. But the focus on uh, identity issues uh, that are since then the major issues of political and electoral struggle led to overshadow other uh, central claims and grievances of the revolution. The first one is the remediation of justice, establishing the facts related to oppression during the first revolutionary situation and the judgment of officials. And the second one is the employment and labor, since almost uh, 800,000 uh, individuals are officially unemployed in, 20, uh, in 2011, representing 21% of the workforce. It's chiefly for this reason that the process of constitutional change, which should be completed in 2013, uh, if we are to believe the recent statement, the statements by the head of government, is problematic. On one side, many opposition parties are contesting the Troika electoral uh, legitimacy, arguing that the high abstention rate at the, election, uh, the elections of, for the Constituent Assembly, around 45% uh, uh, of likely voters and registered, tarnishes the representativeness of the three ruling parties. This denunciation is politically dangerous because uh, it led to the removal of the strength of the electoral process and it may be understood paradoxically as a call to return to the author authoritarian uh, rule. On the other hand, uh, the focus on issues of identity and the place of Islam in society leads to stigmatize Islamists as non-democrats and ultimately to bring up the former party state whose members have recently coalesced. This former political elite, elite uh, might be tempted to guarantee a return to order, arguing both their historical legitimacy and their state uh, skills. I conclude in one minute. Okay. Thus, we have seen that the way to a new constitution in Tunisia uh, was both a widely popular claim uh, and a way uh, for the former political and economical uh, elite uh, to reposition themselves, even passing the revolutionary demands and grievances in the background. The polarized positions seen in the recent months shows uh, how the process is not completed. Uh, the revolution is uh, ongoing, an ongoing process, and that contrary to common opinion, it is less on the side of uh, the Islamists that we should fear a counter-revolution 
that on the side of the former executives of the Constitutional Democratic Rally, associated or supported by a democratic opposition who, whose links with the, with the base remain weak and whose social and e economic agenda and program remain largely indigent and unable to meet the expectations of the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to underline uh, that there are some parallelisms between the two cases, as you, I'm sure, also see. Um, when we talk about uh, a social, a popular claim, demand for the making of a new constitution, and how this could also be shaped by political and economic elites in a way so as to create some privileges for themselves. I think that, that was an important point. And uh, we, we have some similar discussions in our country too. For example, we have discussions about whether or not uh, Sharia will prevail. And we sometimes reduce the discussion only to that point or some similar points, whereas we have to look at the real demands, claims that lie behind claims by the people. And sometimes the media doesn't portray everything in uh, that uh, detail. Now I turn to Egypt. Rami Masen is a lawyer, a uh, jurist, who has been uh, involved uh, in this with a number of politicians and because he served as consultant to a number of them and uh, he is uh, also trying to create some legal awareness and that's why he is established an NGO called Develop Together. You have the floor. In the beginning I am very pleased and honored to be among you today to contribute in the proceedings of the conference in your beautiful country, Turkey, but uh, I prefer that I can speak in Arabic. كنت أفضل إن أنا أتكلم باللغة العربية دي لغة بلدي and وأجد ترجمة Arabic translate. لكن للأسف لا خاصة إن معانا الجزائر وتونس وفي حد من السودان وفي كذا لكن من إيش ترجمة بالعربي فا okay I will I will speak in Arabic and I will talk till you as in English. And they'll talk <laughs> uh, till you say, stop, we are pulling, and you are pulling. So my speech, <laughs> um, my speech will address the recent political change in Egypt that have happened since the toppling of the old regime in uh, 11 February 20, uh, 2012. I will also shed the light of on the main causes and ramification of our Egyptian revolution. Our Egyptian revolution, Yaskut, Yaskut Hosni Mubarak, Yaskut Hokm al Askar, Yaskut Kulliman as a Shaheed, Naam al Horea, Wal Adela Democratia, these slogans, the revolutions mean demanded change it over and over in every protest. Freedom social justice, human dignity, none of this mean, none of this mean demanded has been met. Egypt has been a republic since 18th June 1953, since the declaration of the public, uh, declaration of the republic. In early 2011, following the Tunisia revolution, there was a revolution in Egypt, mass protests, completed Mubarak, the leader of the National Democratic Party, to, re to resign on 11 February 2011, ending his fifth, year, fifth year term in office. The, outside, the outsiding of Mubarak was followed by a series of arrests of and or imposed travel pains on high profile figures on charges of causing the death of five, uh, 500 uh, demonstrators and the injury of more than 5,000 5, uh, 5, as well as charges of emplacement, profiting money, money laundering, and oppose of human rights. 
Mubarak was replaced by the Superior Council of the Armed Force, which dissolved the Parliament of Egypt, suspended the Constitution of Egypt, and promised free, open presidential and parliamentary elections before the year's end and within six months. On uh, 20 March, a constitution, constitutional referendum was voted on and based the provisional constitution of the Arab Republic of Egypt or constitutional declaration of uh, 2011 in the new provisional fundamental law of Egypt. Fundamental law of Egypt. It was deposited on March 13, 2011, by the Egyptian Supreme Council of the Armed Force. <laughs> no revolution. <laughs> Who have been in power since the former President Hosni Mubarak is powerful to the Supreme Council of the Armed Force on February. 2011. The article provisional constitution was proclaim, proclaimed to op, or as a working constitution in the current political translation period following the revolution until a new one is drafted and approved. The new provisional constitution have included the most recent am amendments publicly, public, publicly approved in a referendum, provisional articles defending the powers of the executive and judicial branches, as well as institution law to govern the presidential limiting uh, the presidency to two four-year terms, providing judicial supreme su supervision of elections, requiring the present, uh, present to appoint a duty calling for a commission to draft a new constitution following the parliamentary elections and others. Access to professional presidential elections by candidates. 3,000 3, signatures for at least 15 provi provides 13 members of a chamber of the legislative or nomination by a party holding at last one. Set in the legislatures, where our parliamentarians election process. It has paved the way for parliamentary elections in late two, uh, two, 2011 and presidential elections in 2012. Directly, directly stupid that the newly elected parliament for a new constitutional drafting committee, the Constitution Assembly of Egypt, to write a new constitution. Freedom was given to establish political parts only by notifying concerned authorities, resulting in establishing several political parts named after or in relation to the 20, 25 January Revolution. There, therefore, since the revolution, Islamist party, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, have, have shown unprecedented strength in the new, more democratic landscape taking leading rules in constitutional changes, voter mobiliza mobilization, and protests. This, this was a noted concern among the secular and youth movements who wants any elections to be held later, rather than sooner, so that, that, that, that they might catch up with the uh, already well-organized groups. Elections were held in September 2011 with the Party of Liberty and Justice, the newborn party of the Muslims Brotherhood. Gaining 48, 48 present, 48 from 
percentage, 48 from court vote in the elections, although many claim that, the, that this victory for the Brotherhood means the control of regions party over Egypt yet. The youth movements and liber, liberal parties bid on people's con, con, constitutions and the normal to, to, to learn people of Egypt wouldn't allow another Iran in Egypt. The process draft law for the electoral system to be used was revealed on 13 May 2011. Constitutions it returned first past the post voting for two thirds of the seats, with only one third of the seats elected by proportion proportional representation represent, representations. However, later it was changed as to two thirds. 33, uh, 332 of MBs to be elected proportionally from lists. On 7 July 2011, the Caracterial Government approved the new electoral law. It outlined a new 50-50 division between 50-50 division between proportional seats and FPTP seats. The minimum uh, age limited for the candidates is also to be reduced from 13 to 25. On 21 July 2011, the SCAF announced that the election for both the People's Assembly and the Shura Council would be held in three rounds in October with 15 days intervals in between. That half the seat will be reserved for laborers and farmers. That the women's quota introduced under Mubarak will be be abolished. In late September 2011, again, a new vision was announced in which only one third of the seats would be elected by an FPTP vote. However, they, over this directly elected MPs, could, could only be independents and not members of political parts. This rest this restriction led to threat or the elections by a wide, a wide swath of the political parts which, which intended to consent to the election. The party states that their demands for change in the electoral law would have to be met by 2 October, else they would be be a court the election. After a meeting with political party leaders on 1 October 2011, the SCAF agreed to allow party members to run for the directly elected states, set a clearer timetable for the translation of civilization rule and possi possibility approach multi-trail multi for the civilizations. About 15 million people were eligible to vote out of the population in excess of, 20, in excess of 85 million with candidates from 15, 50 legislated political parts. The overall vote turn out is 54. Freedom and Justice Party went 47 47 percentage of lower house parliamentary seats followed by the Noor party winning. The Noor party winning 24.7 of seats. A total of 15 political parties are represented in this parliamentary of uh, four, 400 and, uh, 498 elect, elected seats will uh, 21 parts were limited for party lists 
uh, seats because they did not attend the uh, uh, point, 0.5 percentage votes on the national level. Ten members of parliament were directly appointed by head of SCAF. On the other hand, out of total two, two, two, 217 seats in the upper house, lower 118, 180 seats are up for grabs and, uh, and the the also seats shared by appointed after the present the president the present election. The president elect or, or, or organally the election was planned to be held in three stages, with the third stage taking pla taking place on four or five March and run offs on uh, eleven slash twelve March. But in early January 2012, the election process was sipped up to shorten the, tra the transitions period. On January 24th, Mushir uh, Tantawi uh, announced that he would be lifted, lifting the state of emergency just one day before the first anniversary of the start of the revolution. On January 25th, the Egyptian people made the one first anniversary of the beginning of the uh, Egyptian revolution, February. On February, uh, the first February 2012, more than 70 people wo wo were killed at a football game in a, uh, in a Pursaid, state of Pursaid. Members, <laughs> yes, it's the same message. Okay, I, I will go through, but... <laughs> I'm trying to go through. Sorry. Yeah. But I will put this paper... Maybe the drums Okay. Okay. The presidential election will be held in Egypt on 23 and 24 May. 24 and 23 and 24 May, with a run of 16 and 17 June 2012, and if necessary, it will be the second presidential election in Egypt's history with more than one candidate, following the. 2005 election and the first presidential elect election after the 2011 Egyptian revolution during the Arab Spring. Rules. The rules for the election were released on 13 January 2012. Candidates have to be born in Egypt to Egyptian partners. Parents may not hold dual uh, nationality and may not be married to a foreigner uh, to be nominated. They require the support of 13 MBs or uh, 30 uh, hundred voters, according to Electoral Committee, the formal, formal registration process for candidates started on 10 March and ended on uh, 8 April 2011. This is uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on April yes, on April twenty on April twenty six SCAF announced uh, announced its final list of thirteen candidates and now with the transitions period now stretched out to nearly uh, eighteen months. Some are Fearful, fearful of last minute by which the military may decide not to hand over power at all. We'll see if Egypt might witness another revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
I feel a little bit responsible because I just, uh, you know, cracked the, you know, uh, structure of the dissertation. Maybe, uh, could I stress that two points that I suppose that you wanted to mention? Yeah. One is the, uh, the presidential elections are very important because it is, uh, it's a presidential system which we have in Egypt. And the second, I suppose, the constitutional assembly uh, is also another step if we will see a real a second revolution or not. Is it so? Just, do you mind? Okay, I think. Just briefly putting it. Okay. I think, in my opinion, uh, in Egypt will be, uh, will be there about two or three months, will, will be there second revolution. Because, number one, um, the parliament didn't make a good life, didn't make a good political life, didn't make didn't it change the uh, uh, Egyptian life. Number two, uh, till now, the millions in Tahrir Square still. Till this moment, till this moment in Egypt, uh, there are two or three millions in Tahrir and in uh, Skav and in uh, other, other ways on Egypt. So we think, uh, I am and uh, most of Egyptians think there are two, there are, will be two, uh, another revolution after two or three months, uh, uh, I think that. Number two, election system, election system, or election president system, I think, um, till now, the committee who make the election uh, uh, the elections in Egypt, I think it's, uh, it's do it very bad, do it very bad for all Egyptians, do it very bad for all candidates, and I think we will need a, a, a good law, a good law in uh, uh, which, which make all of Egyptians can voting in the Egypt and the other uh, in the world. Number two, I think, in, uh, is uh, uh, this committee will be uh, make the, uh, the elections not good, not good on the uh, on the Egyptian on the Egyptian side or on the uh, the other of countries. So I think that uh, this system this system is very bad and didn't make didn't make any change, didn't make any uh, powerful, didn't make any good life in Egypt. So, uh, so that I think all, most of, uh, most of Egyptian thinks that there are another revolution since two or three months ago. Ramit, thank you very much. Okay, another revolution is coming. I would like to give the floor to Ayhan Bilgen. Ayhan Bilgen uh, is a journalist and a writer, and since 2009, uh, he is uh, the uh, one of the founders of the Democratic Constitutional Movement. Well, if microphone does not come to us, we have to approach the microphone closer. Uh, this is uh, what uh, the struggle for democracy entails. Well, in meetings like this, uh, there is a particular difficulty uh, to uh, be a speaker because some of the participants and listeners, either they live with you in the same country and follow the developments very closely in that country, so you either try to address them, and in that case, you enter into a very detailed uh, discussion, uh, which makes it impossible for the foreign participants to fully understand the de this detailed uh, discussion. If you do the reverse, then uh, they will maybe the foreign participants will understand uh, you better, but their speech will be very superficial for those who know the uh, uh, state of affairs in Turkey be uh, much better. Well, uh, maybe I should uh, say a few words about the Arab Spring. This will be a torture for the... <laughs> 
uh, for the interpreters, uh, we say that if a, if a dramatic uh, situation does not directly uh, influence us, then uh, we can uh, we can be satisfied. So if the snake doesn't come and bite you, then I don't have anything against the snake. This is the uh, translation of the proverb. So if you listen to the Turks, it seems as if we were the only driving forces behind the change in the Middle East, as if we are the leader and the manager of all these changes. If one would ask how many of your diplomats know Arabic and how many people in the Turkish um, intelligence services uh, knows Arabic, uh, these figures will show the clarity of the situation. Unfortunately, uh, this is also uh, in connection with the role that Turkey has assumed uh, in recent years uh, and also the language it uses. Obviously, every country would like to be a strong leader in its, uh, and an influential leader in its region. However, in order to be able to do that, you have to be aware of your own realities. If you are not aware of your own realities in your country, then it, w it won't be possible for implementing an efficient foreign policy. Obviously, there are other parameters to do that, but uh, the uh, most uh, issue that one should discuss here in this connection is the domestic politics in uh, Turkey. If you make a formal comparison, Obviously, Turkey's regime is uh, quite democratic. Uh, uh, we have, uh, we, ha uh, we are a democratic country formally since 1946. There is a multi-party constitutional system since, since 1946. We hold free uh, and independent elections. There is a free media. There is a uh, free and liberal uh, private sector. So there are many formal appearances to say that. But are these factors uh, the real? Uh, uh, measures for the existence of a real democracy. If you uh, compare this regime uh, to dictatorships, to kingdoms uh, and so forth, yes, relatively we might be stronger. But where is the limit to media independence and freedom? What is the criteria to measure uh, and to answer the question whether there is media freedom or under which conditions the media freedom is in danger? If you uh, know uh, that uh, more than 100 uh, journalists are in jail today, is a sufficient criteria uh, because this is known by uh, the prime minister, the president, and many ministers representing Turkey abroad claim, claim that these persons are not in jail because they are journalists and they practice the profession of journalism. Uh, because uh, of other things they are in jail, they say. But what is the criteria uh, to judge this? Uh, some of them are accused of uh, th threat, uh, of uh, theft, terrorist activities, uh, embezzlement, uh, and uh, corruption, and so on. So then you start calculating five or five, 15, 20 of them are embezzlers, uh, 20, 25 are, uh, have uh, been committing fraud uh, and the rest. However, uh, when you look at the indictments prepared against these journalists, because that should be the basic document here, uh, these do uh, indictments contain neither of the sort. Even if you read these indictments only superficially, then you get a different picture of Turkey but if you enter into the details, you are faced with another reality. Uh, the fact that we are holding free elections, is that a good indicator? I will mention two things, and I would like to uh, give you examples from practical life. For instance, the 10% hurdle, election or hurdle. Two elections before, Uh, 
uh, Turkey witnessed a, a, a, an election where almost half of the vote cast uh, was not represented in the uh, parliament. And since then, the parliament, the, uh, that was the elections of uh, 2002 there, 40 to 50 percent of the votes remained outside of the parliament because of the 10 percent hurdle. But uh, that 10 percent had it been lowered, then maybe uh, this parliamentary arithmetic will not come into being, and maybe we would be uh, governed by uh, coalitions right now. Another important issue is the inter-party democracy. You may become a candidate uh, from a party and you may uh, stand for election, but if your inter-party democracy is almost uh, zero, and if everything is determined by the uh, party leader, then it is impossible uh, and it won't mean being, uh, it won't mean much uh, that the elections ha are under uh, the, the protection of the constitution and the law. Yes, that was a picture of the Turkish democracy. The, just to show you why Turkey needs a new uh, constitution and what kind of a process uh, is it implementing right now. We have to put all this uh, onto a pillar. Uh, in order to understand it very well, because Turkey, if in the first place, has a very serious uh, Kurdish problem. Uh, in the last 30 years, we had an environment of armed confrontation where t uh, 10,000s of uh, people lost their lives. According to the official figures uh, pronounced by the government is uh, that there was a spending of $500 million. That was the economic cost of this uh, war. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, forget uh, the um, internally displaced people, uh, forget uh, the damages done uh, to human lives, and so on and so forth. In Turkey, uh, uh, Turkey has come to the position that it can no longer uh, govern this uh, situation. This is why uh, Turkey is in, in need of a new uh, constitution. Everybody, every who has a um, clear conscience uh, makes that statement. Not only social democrats, but also conservative people, be it in the civilian organization or in the media, everybody agrees uh, that uh, uh, the most uh, urgent reason for uh, having a new constitution is the Kurdish problem. Uh, how uh, does one wish the Kurdish problem to be resolved uh, so that this uh, can be uh, realized in a peaceful environment after uh, the new constitution is adopted? I think this uh, is the question to which we have to look for an answer. Uh, we are discussing. We have to make a discussion about the rights of the Kurds, uh, and this session will not be sufficient for that. And secondly, we have to discuss how actively the Kurds will take part in this constitutional process, because. Uh, uh, uh, there are two definitions for the preparation of the uh, constitution. First of all, it's in content, and the second one, it's the way it is uh, prepared. Uh, for the second uh, issue, I would like to give you an example. Uh, how long can uh, the writing of a new par uh, constitution take? This uh, duty has been uh, assumed uh, by the parliament. In the parliament, there are four political parties represented. There is a committee that is uh, governing the preparation and the writing of the text of the new constitution in the Turkish parliament, including also a Kurdish party. The, uh, NGOs, uh, constitutional platforms, uh, many other institutions presented their views to that uh, effect. And now they will start to write the test text. During that process, we don't know how much uh, the um, 
submitted proposals uh, will be taken into consideration. There is no statement to the public opinion to that effect. Imagine uh, you are calling out to, to the civil society, to the universities, claiming that the civilian society does not participate in this pro uh, process sufficiently. Uh, they don't uh, make their views heard. But on the other hand, you do not make any explanations at all uh, about how these proposals will be taken into consideration. The second issue is uh, with regard to the methodology. Uh, the uh there is the Democratic uh, Society Congress, which is the platform uh, for the Turkish, uh, for the Kurdish groups. They would like to establish a stand, and they would like to get some uh, signatures regarding their four uh, requirements, like the autonomy, definition of the citizenship, uh, the mother tongue, and so on. And however, they are not allowed to establish a stand which is open to public so that the public can come and vote there. None of the governors allow this, uh, Ahmed Turk and uh, his colleagues. Uh, would like to come to the parliament to explain uh, their party's view on the constitutional preparation. However, some of the committee members uh, tell them that we do not consider you as our legitimate uh, counterparts and uh, as the representatives. Therefore, we won't allow you to come uh, to the parliament and we won't listen to you. The dimension with regard to the youth, uh, to the uh, women, to the Alawites, or the conscientious objectors, trade unions, I leave everything aside, although they are of utmost importance. But if uh, you make a constitution for the solution of the Kurdish problem, this is the state of participation of the Kurdish people to this process. Maybe I'm drawing a very pessimistic picture, but uh, I still believe that in this year, all. Uh, Turkey will uh, continue its political life with a new constitution. And I'm thinking of what type of a constitution will be written, how democratic will it be, how, to which extent will it uh, be capable of solving the Kurdish problem. And in that respect, I have very serious uh, concerns. Well, tell me when I go into time difficulties so that I can wrap up. And I apologize again uh, to the interpreters because I will tell you an anecdote because uh, it is uh, very difficult uh, to make a proper analysis of certain situations. Most of the countries here are coming from uh, the uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, countries, and they are Islamic countries, so they know the procedures of how to practice the namaz. Namaz is something that you have to perform in uh, the uh, Islamic religion, is the Muslim religion. There is an anecdote uh, uh, from the Bektashi sect. A senior person was uh, said, uh, asked, uh, uh, can you ma take the namaz before um, having washed yourself properly? according to the uptest. And the Bektashi answered, yes, we did it, and it was in to end OK. So in a, an environment where so many people, so many media people, so many academicians, so many Kurdish people, so many pol politicians are jailed uh, because of uh, membership to an, honor, uh, uh, an organization. While so many people are still detained, I don't know whether a democratic constitution will be prepared. The answer would be, yes, we did it, and it went OK. You may claim that, uh, but to which extent this is a democratic constitution and to what extent this will democratize Turkey will still be a big question mark. So for, I would like to dwell on the uh, participative mechanisms, uh, therefore. Participation is, uh, does not only mean expressing your view like the um, Helsinki Citizens uh, uh, Association Assembly. Um, 
we have activists who know the caucuses very well. Uh, I know that uh, you are very knowledgeable people. And uh, in front of you, uh, I can't say that participation only means uh, stating your opinion. This would be a joke. Uh, participation has many conditions and many forms. And in order to call a constitutional preparation process uh, participative, uh, there are certain sine qua non conditions. And uh, how much of them are implemented in Turkey right now, we don't know. I, I don't want to give you a long list of examples, but I will suffice by mentioning only one or two in order to underline some of the actual situations. One example is uh, the uh, proposal of the chairmanship of human rights attached to the prime ministry. Uh, the participants or, or the members of this institution in order to contribute uh, to the uh, preparation process of the new constitution, they uh, prepared a list of their proposals which included vital issues. First of all, it was uh, uh, one of them was that it would be highly dangerous in Turkey to increase uh, the competences and the authority of the president. And I uh, completely am of the same uh, uh, view, uh, in favor of the same view, because Turkey is very, very rapidly heading towards a non-defined, obscured pre uh, uh, presidential system. And uh, they uh, just uh, make it seem that this is not the case. So they are uh, misleading all the people, which I don't approve at all. Secondly, recently, uh, Turkey has been governed recently through, not through laws, but through uh, governmental decrees. So the, uh, the, the parliament is competent to uh, promulgate laws. Uh, however, that role has been taken over by the government. And uh, uh, uh, and the reasoning was in order to protect of those who make those uh, proposals and that nobody who make the proposal should be punished later on. And therefore, there is an internet site of the Turkish parliament where these proposals were published. And uh, there again, these views are not being published. So we are talking about more transparency, more openness, more democracy. But at the same time, uh, you uh, obscure certain information not only for the civilian population, but also for the public civil servants, because uh, they, uh, you underline the possibility that uh, they uh, might uh, encounter certain problems if they wished uh, to voice their views. So this shows how much uh, trust we have in our environment right now and how free, uh, to what extent, the discussions at this moment uh, are free or not. So let's uh, discuss the Kurdish problem a bit also within the context of the Middle East. The issue between Turkey and Syria uh, has uh, uh, been followed uh, with great importance and very closely by everybody who uh, knows the, the, those relations. These relations are not only neighborly relations. The, uh, Turkey has uh, uh, witnessed the crises or the tensions in other neighboring countries, and Turkey does not take them as seriously as in the case of Syria. For instance, in Greece, they have uh, they are witnessing going through a very difficult process right now which might lead to many important changes in future, but uh, this, uh, these issues are not on Turkey's agenda. Or in the Caucasus, there are many tensions. 
But why uh, is Syria really so important for Turkey? You can have a multiple choice uh, test out of us. Uh, Turkey is very sensitive regarding democracy and would like to uh, democracy to uh, govern all the neighboring countries. Therefore, they want the Baas party to leave that uh, the majority of the uh, population should be represented in the parliament. This is the official discourse course in Turkey. This is the one alternative. The second alternative is uh, the following. Turkey looks into the world through the Kurdish uh, spectacles. Uh, Turkey is determining its uh, policies, uh, stating that everything should happen, but Kurds should not uh, get any independence anywhere. And they are testing this, for instance, in order to change the regime in Syria. Our prime minister goes uh, and uh, has his uh, pictures taken with King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia, as if in Saudi Arabia there is a perfect democratic regime. Uh, as if we want to give the impression that we, the two very democratic powers in the region, make the signal that to Assad that you should leave uh, the government and uh, le leave it to the people, or we go to Qatar and uh, have pictures taken there. Uh, let's uh, read it, uh, read this uh, issue uh, from the historical point of view. It has not even been a year uh, when uh, Gaddafi gave a human rights award uh, to Prime Minister Erdogan. And this was very highly debated in the Turkish uh, public opinion. Who is Gaddafi? What does the human rights award mean? How can you receive an award in that uh, uh, important, uh, su on that important subject from Gaddafi? Uh, you know who Gaddafi is. And against all these criticisms, uh, um, the Prime Minister Erdogan stated uh, that uh, he will never return this award and he set his reasonings also. And afterwards, after some time, uh, certain uh, initiatives were started against Libya. Uh, first, uh, NATO uh, uh, gave her reaction saying that what does NATO uh, to do there? And then Turkey was used by NATO in her territory. And now uh, Libya has uh, finally reached a democratic regime, as far as we call, call it democracy. So we can say a great many things also. But in summary, what I would like to underline is the following. Also in our regional relations and in our internal uh, transformation, uh, we have a regime that is excessively concentrated on the Kurdish issue. The, uh, our measure are the Kurds. Even if we were discussing Sudan uh, uh, or uh, something about, we should have discussed the issue of the uh, Christians living to the south of that country. Uh, and if uh, we were to talk about the danger of an internal war in Turkey, then we have to uh, deal uh, with this problem from the point of view of the Kurdish problem as well. But in an environment uh, where you are so much indexed uh, to the Kurdish issue, I think uh, it is not uh, possible to uh, reach a full democracy. This will be highly naive and highly difficult. Well, a representative uh, democracy crisis. Uh, so our uh, moderator is being very, very polite. She doesn't send me any, any notes yet, but she looks me into the eye and I understand. So I have to wrap up. Well, uh, uh, I don't know whether Turkey is uh, having the formal democracy, democratic institutions uh, functioning or uh, the sociological structure of the Middle East, the sectal, uh, sect differences, economic and social situation. The lesson I draw is the following. Yes, it is good to, be, to get rid of military regimes uh, from regimes like the Baas regime, um, uh, the democratization 
alienation and the alienation uh, of the civilian population from the military is very, very important. These are sine qua non conditions for democracy. We need uh, the democratic regime that will um, protect the uh, citizens and give them the opportunity to take part in the government. Uh, this is a, a qualificated uh, qualification uh, valid not only for this region, globally. Globally, democracy is uh, uh, to be uh, interpreted in a different manner. So, uh, uh, in the United States, where the separation of powers is highest, uh, they even say uh, we are 99%. So this shows a motivation uh, message. But they have another slogan, and I think that is more pertinent and also will shed uh, a light on our way. Uh, if uh, something uh, were to change in the ballot box, then you would have been uh, forbidden that too. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we uh, 10 minutes coffee break would be sufficient for all of us. And then